Come on, somebody. And so we have, we have basically hung you in the heavens for two weeks. The first message was understanding the purpose of God. The message last week expanded it from the principle of the gospel, which is the Abrahamic covenant in the Old Testament. That is that God blessed us to be a blessing. He made room for us and blessing us. And so now we are to make room for others, blessing them with the blessing that we've been given. Everybody say, I am blessed to be a blessing. Okay, and so this morning is part number three of Make Room. We're excited. I thought I heard some music. We're excited. Next Sunday, we're beginning a new series called Frantic. How many of you feel like that could be an accurate description of your life? Frantic. And we're going to do a three-parter, and Pastor Haley is going to open the first week for me. We're using... The, the, the wonderful author John Mark Comer, we just really think he's pretty amazing, and we're using his book called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. And so if you're interested in delving, uh, going deeper, then you can pick that up on any of your um, ebook uh, subscriptions that you might have, or you can grab it off of Amazon or any of the Christian book distributors. It's John Mark Comer, C-O-M-E-R, The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. And so we're excited to talk to you about how we can come unto him and let him give us real true rest, not just good sleep at night, but walking in a place in a position of rest and some of the spiritual disciplines that we can learn how to walk in so that we can, what we're doing in this message, follow Jesus. Because Jesus said to his disciples, he didn't say, hey, believe in me and I'll see you in a few thousand years. He says, come follow me. And that was the idea in the Eastern mindset that you would attach yourself to a teacher and actually do life with that teacher every day. Walk into the marketplace, see how Jesus dealt with conflict, how Jesus responded to people who recognized that he had a gift of miracles and if they would touch the hem of his garment that they would be healed or if Jesus would speak the word or touch them that healing would come. And so... Literally, the kingdom of God is not about a home someday. It's about a walk right now. It's about learning to walk with Jesus right now, listening to his voice and letting him speak through our words. And we speak like Jesus speaks and we act like Jesus acts. Now, bring us back down to earth. I don't do that every day. I'm learning how to do that. I'm learning in my circumstances when I miss it. And this is not an angry God who's ready to throw you out with one mistake. But you learn and you get up and you change and you grow. Come on, somebody. And so this morning, quickly, that's my intro, so I want to get into this. I'm, I'm, I'm going to use just a couple scriptures, but we were so scripture intense in the first two that I'm not going to spend as much time, I'll, I'll quote some, but we're not going to spend as much time turning to and reading a whole bunch of passages. But today I just want to get practical principles. Everybody say, Be practical. And so this morning, look at the word with me, please, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 58. And I'm reading from the NIV, the New International Version. I'd like you to read the scripture with me, please. Find one and read. Here we go. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Give yourselves fully to the what? To the work of the Lord. Now, does that mean God's called everybody to be a preacher? No, there is a work of the Lord in every city that God establishes an outpost of his kingdom, and that's called a local church. I believe that if you're going to actively grow and be a part of the universal church, you need to be committed to a local church. Everybody say a local church. That's where we grow. That's where we do life. That's where the, 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 the rough edges of the living stones rub together. And I, I, I learn to forgive and I learn to walk in grace and I learn to ask for forgiveness of other brothers and sisters and, and to show patience and kindness and gentleness and all of those things that are supposed to be the fruit of the Spirit growing in me. I have to learn that among a people. I can't do it in the wilderness by myself. Somebody say amen. Amen. One thing I want to bring to you this morning, and this is familiar, you've heard it before, but it so applies to everything we're going to talk about. Read it with me. Here I go. If I keep doing what I've always done, I'll keep getting what I've always gotten. 
Now, that's just, that's like my granny talking. That's so common sense. Well, son, you just keep on doing that. Just mess around and find out. <laughs> if I keep doing what I've always done, I'll keep getting what I've always gotten. Say it like you mean it. Come on. If I keep doing what I've always done, I'll keep getting what I've always gotten. Pray with me this morning. Heavenly Father, help us. We call upon you. We submit our hearts and our minds, our souls. I ask in the name of Jesus that you would move by the power of your Holy Spirit through this message. Thank you for the worship this morning. We've lifted the name of Jesus. Make your name great and famous in Crittenden County in the Delta, in the United States, around the whole world. Be Lord. You are Lord. And I just acknowledge before you and every person in this room and those listening online that I desperately need you. I know that apart from you, I can do nothing, but I'm grateful and I'm confident in the, in the fact, the established fact, that in Christ, I am joined to you in one spirit, and because of you, I can do all things that you've called me to do through Christ who strengthens me. I pray today for clarity of thought and for brevity of speech and for, most of all, the work of the Holy Spirit that can only change us. We submit ourselves to you in the matchless name of Jesus. And all of God's people said. Amen. Point number one, following Jesus cannot be separated from serving. There is no possible way that you can call yourself a Christian and there may be seasons when you're going through difficulty or maybe there's, there's grief or maybe there are various circumstances of struggle. Maybe you, you picked up in a couple of jobs just trying to make ends meet. And, I, and, and we very much want to say we have grace for that. But even in that, you can find ways to serve in your community, in your local church. Because we cannot be Christ followers and not follow in Jesus' actions and not follow in his steps. Mark chapter 10 verse 45 says, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to what? But to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So Jesus himself, God in the flesh, Emmanuel, came down and walked an impeccable, sinless life and he poured out his life in service, stooping very low and lifting up those that were downcast and under the oppression of the Roman government and those that were the marginalized and outcasts due to religious prejudice, the Samaritans that were hated by the Jews and the Gentiles that were called dogs by the Jews. Prejudice is not a new thing. It's been around since they stepped out of the Garden of Eden. And we have to recognize that God has called us to serve our fellow humans. It's not just about serving fellow believers or people that think or look like us, but it's about serving the community that God has called us to live and reside in. I just would ask you this morning, can you really say you're a follower of Jesus if you're not serving somewhere? And oh, well, I serve God. Okay, great. You get up in the morning and maybe look at the scripture for a minute or listen to a praise tune on the way to work. But I mean, when's the last time you've shared your faith? When is the last time you have stopped to, when somebody says, would you pray for me? And don't just say, I will, but actually stop and do it right there. Well, Pastor, I don't know how to do that. You know what? You don't have to be a theologian. You don't have to be a scholar. You don't have to quote... Bible verses at all. You can just take their hand and in one sentence say, Father, meet the need of my friend. In Jesus' name I pray. That's all you got to do. Amen. You know what? When you do that in faith, it's not your oppress the impressive language. God moves based on the faith in your heart and the faith and the need in the person that's asking. Oh, God, if we will just step out in faith and throw our leg over the boat, Peter... When Jesus says, come on, get out and walk on this water with me on the water of the delta, there are needs that are to be met. We are to serve Jesus and follow him. Is Jesus calling you to walk alongside him and to serve him? You know what? If, if you keep doing what you've always done, you'll keep getting what you've always gotten. Point number two, knowledge and vision are useless without action. Say it with me. Knowledge and vision are useless without action. It was Hosea 4, 6 says that my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Proverbs 29, 18 says where there is no vision, the people perish. And we are rich in knowledge and we have a vision around here. And you can be stocked full of in your cabinets, understanding the principles of the kingdom of God. But if you're not applying it and taking action, it is absolutely worthless. 
We can study the theology. We can plan the methodology, but without action. I can read all the scriptures about prayer. I can read a great book about prayer and people who've prayed and changed the world. I can attend seminars on prayer. But until I actually get down to pray, what if you have the knowledge and maybe even see the vision? It is useless until you, everybody say, take action. Amen. Is God calling you to take action in your next step? I, I believe he is. You know what? If, if I keep doing what I've always done, I'll keep getting Number three, there are two kinds of people. Learn this. They're on your job. They live down your street. They're sitting in the seats that are comfortable in this church this morning. They're in the pews over at Angels Way Baptist next to us. They're at Marion Methodist. They're at Marion First Baptist. There are two kinds of people. There are consumers and there are producers. They're folk that just are soaking up all the benefits and waiting on they check. There are folks that are actually digging in and doing the work, and it's the Pareto principle. 20% of the people do 80% of the work. God, help me grow the tribe of 20%. Put your hands together and give the Lord praise. Come on, we, we love team sports, we love football and baseball, but God doesn't need more fans in the stands. He needs players on the field. I need somebody on that organ help me pump me a little bit this morning. Tambourine, Sister sister Haley. Team, team. We need a team. We need to be on team. You don't just sit here and show up. You need to be on team. Together, everyone achieves more. I believe God is calling every person in this church to get on team with us. And, and with us and help us move the ball down the field and reaching the delta so that we can make disciples who honor God and advance His kingdom. I'm preaching so good this morning, I'm shocking myself. But if I just keep on doing what I've always done, y'all are pretty good. You get anything out of this? Number four, but I don't feel connected. Uh oh. Amen's rising. Spirit's rising in the amen corner. I don't feel connected, Pastor. Serving others is your greatest opportunity to make the connections with others that you are seeking. I, I just don't feel connected. Well, have you ever actually gone to a life group? Have you ever actually hung around instead of Hitting the door when the last song stops. I'm just going to say something to that right now. That burns me up. It's disrespectful. There are things that yet the Spirit of God is doing in the house. Now, I'm going to be a pastor for a second here. Man, it's great. If you send in your tithe on, on, on your text, but if you, you can't wait to get out here and you feel disconnected, but you're never hanging around long enough to shake hands and meet some new people and get, get disconnected, I don't want to hear it. If you don't feel connected, guess what? You're probably not. Anybody still love the pastor this morning? Is the Lord calling you to take a step and get connected? Yeah, I believe he is. Well, guess what? If you keep doing what you've always done, you'll what? This is not, they're going to be the shortest message you've heard me preach in years. I'm the point five out of eight right now. Can you believe it? This message is already half baked. Half done. I'm, I'm going to bring some medicine with the sugar this morning, so I'm not going to be long, okay? Everybody say Practical. Number five, there are multiple ways to serve others at victory. We, we don't have an excuse. 
I, I, I want to challenge everybody in January to worship in one service and serve in one service. Pastor, you actually want us to show up for two services and be here? Yeah, I believe if you really got the vision of this, you can serve in one. Now, guess what? It's so easy on so many of our teams, you can serve and actually be in the service so you don't have to do that. You don't have to miss a service to be a greeter. You don't have to miss a service to be a person who works at the Connect desk or make the coffee. It means you come a little bit earlier in the morning to get the coffee ready. You don't have to miss a service to put out signs in one location only. Just take five or six signs, throw them in your truck, trunk of your car or in the back of your truck and put those out in one designated assigned place that we ask you to in a critical intersection in Marion or West Memphis so that people can begin to see that we have two services, two opportunities to come and hear the gospel. So many things you can do in victory. You don't have to. You can be an usher in the service and don't have to miss the service. The real challenging teams are actually taking up a ministry vision and teaching our children, nurturing them in the, in the, in the instruction and in the admonition of the Lord. Thank God for people who have a vision to teach our children. And, and, and to be willing to Take one Sunday a month and, and to serve in the nursery so young families can come in here and they can hear the word and they can be built up and edified and strengthened and encouraged and find out who they are in Christ and make a life commitment and turn to the Lord while their babies are being loved on and taken care of. You, you, you can be on the security team. Are you packing? Well, we want to know about it before you show up with it. Thank God for you, those of you, there's a dozen or more in this room right now. You don't know who they are. I just ask you that if somebody gets crazy that you be careful with that aim. I'm doing this right here. That ain't bad for a 63-year-old, man. It may hurt later, I don't know. You know what? You can serve in both services on one Sunday a month. And then come the other three. There are a myriad of ways. There are multiple teams that don't require you to miss the actual service. You can greet in the first and attend the first. You can greet in the second and leave. Guess what? Those of us that are speaking got to be here both. Everybody say B-O-A-F, both. <laughs> the musicians got to be here. Everybody say both. So... You know, it's amazing how you'll go sit all, all mm, weekend long on a dusty baseball field for a traveling team and don't even think twice or complain about that stuff. Don't even look at me like that because I did it for years with my son all over Tennessee and Louisiana and Oklahoma and Texas and Arkansas. We'd drive two cars, and I would stay and drive in late Saturday night so I could preach on Sunday morning, and Dawn would stay maybe if they well, were in a round robin or a double elimination or whatever, and maybe they were up for a game on Sunday. And I'd come in and show up at the house of the Lord and preach while my wife and my son and my baby girl were on a baseball field somewhere in Tulsa. I know all about that. I know about seasons of life. But I still found a way. Well, pastor, that's what you get paid to do. Let me tell you something. You better, you better back up. There's a whole lot that a pastor does. There ain't enough money in the world to put up with. You know what you can, sir? Let me just, I stopped that. I edited that. That was Dennis the Menace and not the Holy Ghost. And I, thank you, Jesus. I'm, I'm cutting some wood, sister. You can serve once a month or you can serve as often as you like. You can be on the coffee team one Sunday per month in both services, and you can serve the same service, the second service every Sunday on the coffee team. You can be on the sign team and just put signs out on Friday afternoon and pick them back up on Sunday evening. We need some helping hands. We've lost that team. Help, what is helping hands? Helping hands is when one of our members goes in the hospital, then we've got a handful of folks that have put their name on the list that have said, I'm willing when I'm cooking for my family to throw an extra casserole into the freezer so I don't have to cook for it when it happens. But let's say Sister 
Sister Bottle Stopper goes into the hospital, and she's the cook for the house, and Brother, brother Dr. Bottle Stopper is not that good a cook, and there's only so many times you can, you can order DoorDash. And so the church shows up, and we bring a meal. And if you're on the Helping Hands team, then, then we've asked you to have a casserole ready that all you've got to do is just stick a little card on it and give them instructions on how to eat it. And you've already got it ready, and it's easy. It's a place where you can serve other brothers and sisters in the body of Christ. We need folks that will prepare and freeze an extra one and be ready on demand for a person or a family in need, hospitalization or grief. There are so many different kinds of teams and a myriad of ways to serve. We are really without an excuse. Are you serving right now? Are you serving now or are you merely supporting your excuse? If I keep doing what I've always done... Well, are you getting anything out of this? Number six. Number six, we need to understand our shape. Spell it with me. Here we go. S-H-A-P-E. God made every one of us unique. You have spiritual gifts. Everybody say spiritual gifts. You have heart desires. H, heart. As a matter of fact, I think one way that you can find out what your purpose is, the destiny God has on your life, is to ask yourself three questions. This is heart-related. What makes you mad? What makes you sad? And what makes you glad? That's where your heart is. What makes you angry when you see it happening to people in our community? What makes you sad when you see the condition or the circumstances of an individual's life that you care for? What makes you glad? Those three things are a great indication of the kind of way God has wired your heart for your sympathetic, empathetic responses. A, S-H-A, so spiritual gifts, heart, heart desires. A, abilities, natural abilities. Some of you are mechanical. That's not me. Nope, I'll, I'll, I'll drop an extra 50 at, at Lowe's so they can put that 7,000-part grill together. Because if I put it together, I'm going to blow up my house and the neighbors too. I'm just being honest. I, I'm, not, I'm musical. I'm creative. I, I, I can put things together that can inspire people and give a talk. But I, don't ask me to take a screw and put it in 40,000 pieces. Just uh-uh. No, no, no. I, I wasn't a Lego kid. Don't even talk to me about that. I remember when my children were into it. And I... Lost my sanctification a couple of times in the night stepping on one of those big Legos. And I didn't say glory to God. And I said, Lord, forgive me. Your abilities, you have natural abilities. Some of you are organizational. Some of you have teaching, teaching, speaking, exhortational gifts. Some of you are natural born cheerleaders and we need you out front on the team cheering us on. Some of you are discerners, and you need how to properly learn what that discernment is. It doesn't just mean you're really good at critiquing everybody. I'll leave that alone. What are your natural abilities? Let's find a team where you can, and maybe it's not even here yet. Maybe you've got a desire in your heart that you actually help us launch a new team or a new ministry. Wow. Wow. That's what we want. P, S-H-F-E, spiritual gifts, heart, abilities. P, personality. Everybody is not an extrovert. I, I don't meet a stranger. I can talk to anybody anywhere, and everybody's not that way. That's fine. You don't have to be. You know what? If you're more introverted, we're not going to put you out on a street corner with a handful of tracks and tell you to preach a three-point message. It's not going to happen. Maybe the coffee team, maybe the nursery, maybe, maybe even push yourself a little bit out of your comfort zone. Do your muscles in your face work where you can smile? And, you, and your elbow works and you can stick out your hand and say, welcome to victory. Yeah. Well, Guess what? You can meet new people and become a little bit more confident and not feel so shy or introverted. Oh, that, that's just too much. Well, praise God, there, there are ways we can help you find a place to be a part of something bigger than yourself. Being on a team, hallelujah. Put your hands together. 
finally, life experiences. Everyone in this room has experienced things, and because of that, you've learned lessons that everybody in the else, maybe not everybody, but somebody else in this room can learn from your life experiences. And you have a unique shape. First Peter 4.10 says, each of you, everybody say everybody. everybody. No, come on, say it like you're in the South. Everybody. everybody. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. Each of you. And let me just say this. Well, I don't, I don't really understand my, all of my shape. I don't, I don't know what kind of team I want to serve on. Well, guess what? Just dive in and do a first serve. That's what we do in foundations class. We challenge everybody to a first serve. You don't have to do it forever. It's not, you're not signing in blood. This is not a 20-year commitment. Let's just, let's just say, let's just serve for a semester, okay? If that's, you've never served before on a team. Because sometimes jumping on a team helps you to sharpen your own awareness of your personal gifts that God has graced you with. And you get something and you find out that you're comfortable in it and you love it. And sometimes you get in something that makes you a little bit uncomfortable, but you see yourself growing and you stay there and grow some more. Children's minister Beth over there is giving me some amen clapping over there. Yes. She says, I need some help. And when we start two services, we need teams. We need to grow these teams. We still need help in all these teams. Are you being a faithful steward of God's grace in the form? They, they in my seat. You know, I don't know where there is a deed filed on each chair in this room. We all own all these seats. And I would just say to you, if somebody's in your seat, follow the leaders. Have you ever noticed since you've been coming to Victory that there ain't no throne chairs up here like you see in most churches? I'm going I'm to let that sink in a little bit. And it isn't because that's just the new wave in the last 15 years. That's the way we've been doing it for 36 years. Because I personally have a conviction that before a pastor is a leader, he or she is a sheep. And we rise up out from among the sheep where we are called to hear the gospel and the word of the Lord. And we are empowered by his spirit to go. And in humility... As a sheep first, we stand and humbly bring the word of the Lord, not as someone lording over the flock. You will never, now I can't say what will happen when I'm dead and gone. There's not a designated pastor's parking space out there. Nothing wrong, I'm not being judgmental in any church that does that. It's just not my style. I will park on gravel to create a space for guests that are coming in for the first time. If the house is full, I will get up and move over. I will stand up. Guess what? It's amazing how folk will open the doors of their hearts of hospitality when somebody comes into their home, and then they'll get all stingy when they come to the house of God. Would you behave like that toward a guest who came into your house? And you know, let me just say this. If you've been sitting in the same seat for 15 years, and that seat's got the shape of your, your blessed assurance, change is good. Change is good. <laughs> Y'all still love me this morning? Amen. You know what, if, it, if it's too much for you, you get sweet Pastor Haley next Sunday. <laughs> Why would we treat guests in the Lord's house less than we would in our own homes? Everybody say, help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. If I keep doing what I've always done, I'll... And yes, I told you it was going to be short, point number eight, and I'm finished. You're going to beat the Baptist and the Methodist to the buffet today. Musicians, come back, please. Number eight, it ain't about me. It's not about me. Victory is not for everybody. 
we're going to do some stuff that you not, may not be fond of. If I did what I wanted all the time, we'd have everything we'd sing would be the, the first one we sang. I, I, nobody wants all that all the time. It's just, it's good. It's a nice spice. It's, it's home cooking. It's what I grew up on. It's, it's chicken and dumplings. It's, it's greens. It's collards. I, I'm trying to decide if I'm going to tell a joke. This is a true story. Brilliant, brilliant man, IQ that was crazy off the scale. Love Jesus. My mentor, Dr. Kelly Varner in North Carolina, wrote 50 books. And he moved to North Carolina as a young man. Very first, he's from, from Maryland. And he moved down to North Carolina to pastor Praise Tabernacle, where we had a school of ministry. And Dawn and I were both in the school of ministry and took a number of courses for two years. And then I actually taught a, a, a subject called the Tabernacle of David on praise and worship in that school of ministry. And when, when Dr. Kelly Varner first moved to town, one of the future elders asked him if he liked collards. And they didn't say greens. They said, do you like collards? And Brother Varner kind of got big eyed. And he said, oh, I, I like everybody. <laughs> now, to my African-American brothers and sisters, that truly was an innocent part, thing on him. And you know me. You know my heart. We are all about the tribe's of every nation, tribe, and tongue. And let me just say something to you. I, and that may have made a couple of even white folks uncomfortable. Let me just let me say something. To you. We gotta we gotta pull down all these walls and realize that grace is bigger than race. And God is going to bring Latinos and Asians and African Americans and mixed couples and folks into this room with willing hands to take up his cause and to get on his team and accomplish his purpose in the earth. The gospel is a worldwide vision. We need to think globally to the uttermost parts, but we need to act locally. If I keep, help me, it's my last time I'm going to say it. If I keep doing what I've always done, I'll keep getting what I've always gotten. Bow your hearts with me, please, for a word of prayer. Father, help us this morning to know that following Jesus can't be separated from serving. Lord, it's not about us. It's about you and your heart and your kingdom. Forgive us, Lord, where we've lost sight of that and we made it about us. I am truly thankful to pastor a church with five generations of wonderful, remarkable people. I'm thankful to say that we have the only truly integrated church in Crittenden County. I'm thankful thankful for people that are coming, Lord, from different backgrounds and different cultures and racial makeups and, Lord, all kinds of circumstances because that's the patchwork quilt of the kingdom of God. We're grateful for that. Move in our midst and help us to see that grace is bigger than race and the love of God in us can pull down the stupidity of prejudice and poverty and ignorance and apathy that dominates in the delta. We'll be careful to give you praise. Call us by your spirit to be men and women of influence in our communities, in our schools, in our neighborhoods, in this local church. We ask you for this in Jesus' name. Heads still bowed. Anybody in the room, if you've never crossed the line of faith and said, Jesus, come into my heart, change me. That's the most critical, most wonderful decision you'll ever make. Not going to be long. If that's you and you would say, Pastor, please pray for me. I'm in a hard place. I need Jesus. Whether you've been walking with him for 30 years or you're the first time to, to trust him, would you just slip your hand up? I want to pray for you right now around the room. Father, in Jesus' name, you see these hands. We lift them up to you and we pray for your strength and your mercy, the Holy Spirit to do what only he can do. Lead, lead us, guide us, save us, transform us, we pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, put your hands together and give the Lord praise.